Welcome to the Our City Church Podcast. Whether it's your first time listening or you're a weekly listener, we hope this message impacts your life, your relationship with God, and your relationship with others. Here's Pastor Chris. You know, I, I, if you are a guest, I want you to understand that we are a church that believes in um, a, a God of joy and celebration, and that we should honor people who have been there for us and done things for us. Um, and I know that today, you know, we, we honored a great man. You've never met him. You, you probably, you're never going to most likely meet him this side of heaven. And, and it's awesome for us to be able to, to explain and express to you and show you this is how much we believe God cares, not just about Pastor Majeski, but this is how much he cares about you. And I hope that as you just kind of sat in that, you were able to experience this is the heart of God for his people. He has this huge heart, and I hope that it's able to help you see how much God, um, how he sees you and how much he loves you and how he wants what's best for you and he wants to celebrate you. He wants to cheer you on, that he is rooting for you, that God is for you, he's not against you, that he desires great things for you. And it's not just, listen, it's not just for people who lived a great life, a life like Pastor Majeski. I wouldn't want you to be tempted to think, well, great, God wants to celebrate great men like Pastor Majeski who built this huge legacy of pastors and leaders and church builders and, and people who, you know, do this. It's, it's, it's yes, he, he does celebrate people who have been good and faithful and true and all that. But also, God, he, he will always want to make sure that you understand that he celebrates people who are choosing to even look towards him. That God doesn't just want us to think that it's people who lived and did what was right and good. And if you're sitting here today thinking, man, I don't... I'm not that. It's like, does he really want to bless me? Does God look favorably upon me? Does he actually love me like that? Does he desire time with me? Can't possibly care for me like that. And I understand, again, maybe you might think, like, I can understand maybe this pastor, but maybe you would say, like, I've gone too far. I've done too much. I've got too many mistakes. I've said things I can't take back. I've done things I can't take back on a race, right? Like, I, I mean, there's things that you, <laughs> some of you maybe are like, I can't even remember what I did last night. But I can tell you that we believe here at Our City Church that there is no place that you can go that God's love and grace doesn't want to find you. That it doesn't matter if you lost your temper with your kids. It doesn't matter if you got into a fight with your spouse. It doesn't matter if you failed in a business endeavor or it doesn't matter if you're estranged even currently. When God looks at you, he looks at you with a heart full of love and care. And he, I want to say this to you, I, 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 I think that you picked an excellent week to come here if you're, if you're a guest or just getting back into it. Because thousands of years ago, the people actually wondered some of the same questions when Jesus was on the earth, which was, Okay, who does God really love a lot? And who's allowed to get close to him? And, and who's allowed in church? And who does God want to bless? And does he want to bless me? I mean, I'm, I got my own issues with God, or I got my own frustrations with the church, or I got my own issues with certain people in church. I don't like those kinds of Christians. This person gets on my nerves. Or I've made these mistakes, or I've gone too far. Again, I want you to understand that the people in the original story had the same types of questions. They were wondering these same things about how does God really view me? What does he see me as? And Jesus, he wanted us to be clear on this. So he actually tells a story, and I want to look at it today. And um, I believe God wants to show you exactly how he sees you. No matter what, no matter what you've done, where you're coming from, where you're at, how things are in your life, what's going good, what's not going good, he knows everything about you. Okay? There's nothing hidden from his knowledge in your mind, your heart. You could fool everybody, but you can't fool God. He knows everything. He knows your thoughts. He knows your hearts, and he knows all your actions. And watch this. And still loves and desires closeness with you. Now, there's this world-famous story where Jesus tells. And it's world-famous because the title of it in, in, in Scripture kind of got into culture. And now, even if people don't even know what the story is about, they know what this phrase is. And it's written by a man named Luke. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open it to Luke chapter 15. We're going to look at the story that Jesus tells. And what Luke is doing is really amazing. Now, Luke is, let me give you a little background. Everybody say there and then. 
If you're new around here, we want you to know what was happening in the story of the Bible there and then. Because if you can understand the world of the Bible, then the words of the Bible are going to make a lot more sense to you. And we believe the Bible will change your life. I'm a Bible guy. I'm a Jesus guy. But I wasn't always. And so I appreciate the journey that you might be on. So just know that you are welcome. And we are happy to have you right where you're at. We're going to tell you what we believe the Bible means um, and, and help you understand it in its original context. So then you could apply it to the here and now. And we'll get to that in a minute. But here's what's going on there and then. Luke is a doctor, which is why the gospel of Luke, there's four stories called the gospels. The gospel means good news. And the good news of Jesus was written by four different people who had eyewitness accounts that they were able to review and to report on. Now, Luke, he writes as a doctor, so he has more details in his writing than the other three writers. There was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke had more details as a result, again, of him being more of a doctor. Now, in the story we're about to look at, Jesus is hanging around sinners, tax collectors, He's had prostitutes come in and around his life. Jesus has been around people that like in that day and age, you just didn't let around religious people, right? The idea would have been those people shouldn't be in church. Those people don't belong. They've made too many mistakes. They're not doing the life right. So those are not the folks we're supposed to have around the faith. And Jesus then is gonna tell this story. It's called a parable. And it's a, a parable is a story with a specific point. And Jesus taught in parables. He taught in stories. He, in fact, through Throughout this talk I'm about to go into, he had told a story about a lost sheep that got, that got away, right? And then he also tells a story about a lost coin. And now he goes into this other parable, but this time it's about not a lost coin and not a lost sheep, but it's about a lost son, right? And this hits home, right? It hits home for them in that day and age. Why? Well, there was lots of sickness, there was wars. There was brutality in the rulership of the government. The government of Rome was brutal. So it was very common for people to know someone who had lost a son or a daughter. That was not like, no way. It was very like part of normal culture, sickness, people got sick and died. They didn't have the type of medical advancements we have now. This is thousands of years ago. For the sake of time, I want you to kind of hear the point of this story, but I want you to know what's going on. So I want you to hear the overall idea of this story Jesus tells there. Everyone's gathered around. He's told these other two stories about how God sees us and what the kingdom of God is like. Why does he have to tell them what the kingdom of God is like? For two reasons. One, the kingdom of Rome was a phrase that everyone knew. And the way Rome ruled the world was with brutality, violence, overtaxation, and brutal might, okay? So when people hear kingdom, they would get like, whoa, 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 whoa. They get real nervous about that. They, they, they shrink back from that discussion. So Jesus comes along and goes, I wanna teach you what the kingdom, not of Rome, not of this earth, but the kingdom, not of this earth, of God is like. Now watch, I'm gonna watch you, walk you along. Not only that, but there was a ton of different religious ideas at that time. And, and the people had gotten used to the synagogue kind of like way of life. And a lot of the religious leaders at that time had used their authority positions to keep people they didn't like out of church, away from God. I don't like you. You don't vote for the person I like. You're out. I don't like you. You have, you have certain sins you do. I don't like you. I don't like the things that you believe. I don't like you. So here's what I'm doing. I'm using what I don't like about you. And then I make that be something God doesn't like about you. And I can keep you away. Sound familiar anyway, in any way, shape, or form? Totally brand new idea, right? So religious people have been doing this stuff for thousands of years. They were doing it in Jesus' day. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Jesus tells a story about a man who had two sons. And the younger son asks his father for his inheritance. And he asked it for before his father had died, which is really disrespectful in that culture. To be like, hey, I, I know that you're not dead, but I want the money now because I want to go do my thing. So in that day, the sons would have been serving the father, help the father's inheritance grow because most likely they were farmers, they owned land, and that was kind of like the, the, the culture of the day. Now, this would have been a third of his father's estate because he had two sons. He would have kept a portion for his wife and, 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 and his other family, and he would have given them to his two other sons. That's the culture. So the father, though he has, you know, the ability to say no, he gives him uh, the story Jesus tells. He gives him a whole lot of money. Now the son goes away to a distant country and loses all of it. Can we pause right there and not listen to this Bible story, but just imagine what that would feel like for you to work your tail off so hard your whole life and to take a big chunk of that entrust it to someone that you love in your family and literally poof gone I mean gone like 
just imagine like Vegas, okay? Like as Vegas as you can Vegas for a week is what this boy did, okay? He went wild. He was drinking. He was rolling. The story, the implications of how Jesus tells this story is he goes out and just lives wild living. It was called debauchery. It was like no morals, nothing is wrong, everything is fine, it's whatever I wanna do that feels good. If it feels good, it must be right, okay? So your feelings were made God in this story and Jesus is saying, that's what he did. No more money, done. Now, there's this huge famine that comes on the land and it forces this young man, this son, to hire himself out for work because he doesn't have anything else anymore. And he gets so bad that like even the food like is, is running out in this famine that he is tending pigs on a farm of pigs. He's in a pig pen on a daily basis cleaning it up. And it got so bad that in the middle of pigs, by the way, pigs are filthy animals, okay? I don't know if you know this, but they eat their own feces. They eat their dead like, they're gross. Just put that into your memory banks the next time you barbecue ribs. But, um, which I love and eat. And I just go, Lord, I hope this was the one clean pig. Okay? It's my prayer. Every time I have ribs, I'm like, Lord, I just hope this guy had, like, OCD or something like that. And just cleaned his fingernails and, you know, had to do his stuff. He's eating what the pigs eat to survive. That's how bad his life has gotten. But he comes to his senses. Jesus tells the story. And he realizes this idea. And scripture says, he says to himself, the servants have more than I got right now that serve my dad. Now in that culture, if you were a son, I mean, that was like, you're the prince of the, of the father's kingdom. And now he's out here eating slop, eating pig food in a pig pen, surrounded by the smell and stink of farm life and of stinky, smelly pigs. This is the picture that everyone could get. For us, I don't know the last time you physically saw a pig in person, not at a zoo, okay? Like, I don't know, but like, I could tell you this, that's not normal for us. So it's really hard for us to like, be gagging in our throat right now. But I want you to think of like, nasty smelling stuff. So you, I want you a little gaggy right now, like, <laughs> ill. You're not with me, so I'm gonna get you with me. Are you ready? Some of you have nasty toenails. And you know when you dig that jam out, some of you have smelt it. Gotcha. Welcome to our city church. I wanted you to understand there and then what was happening. Can you tell I was a youth pastor for a long time? Still got it. If you're older and you're like, why would he tell that? Well, because you're not the only person I'm talking to today. Look around the room, y'all. There's old, there's young, there's cool, there's you, and there's, you know, it's all kinds of stuff. I, I gotta work this thing, baby. This thing ain't easy. He's in the middle of his mess. Do you know what it's like? Some of you know what it's like. All joking aside, you know what it's like to wake up the next morning, don't you? And to feel in the middle of a mess and your life just feels like it's awful and it's painful and it feels hopeless and you don't even know how it could ever get worse. And somehow, even maybe for some of you, you just got yourself to church today. And this is it. And you can hardly even believe I'm preaching on this because you're going, God, literally, did you tell him I was coming today? And he didn't. He didn't tell me you were coming. But he knows you and he, and he wants you to hear the way he sees you. And so Jesus is telling this story and this son finally realizes, wait a minute, I, I, I'm, I, I could... My, the servants my dad has are getting better than this. And so he comes to his senses and he decides he's going to go back and, and face his father. He decides he's going to go back and apologize to his father. And I can imagine that on the road home, he's, re he's rehearsing his talk. You ever had to rehearse the talk? On the way to dad, on the way to mom, on the way to husband, on the way to wife, and you're just trying to get the words down. And he's just trying to get the words right. I mean, how could you possibly apologize for something so absolutely irresponsible, immoral, and disrespectful to a man who gave you his whole best of his life and you literally threw it all away. And this is where we pick up the story. Luke chapter 15, verse 20 says this, Jesus is talking. So the young man got up and went to his father. But while 
he was still a long way off. His father saw him. Now let's pause there. A lot of us think that the way that this should go, if you really were honest with how you think God sees you when you're sinning and in, in, in a mess, the way you think the rest of this verse is gonna go is, not you, you know God's good, right? But you sometimes think that when you're really messing it up, that God is just so mad and disappointed with you and just wants to get even or just wants to make you suffer so you learn your lesson. And the, the story Jesus tells, he paints a different picture of a, of a father. It says that while his son was still a long way off, he saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He was filled with compassion. Is that how you see people who are trapped in their sinful, foolish behavior? Do you get filled with compassion towards those people? This is not an excuse for people to continually abuse you and to neglect the need to do the responsibilities that are in your life. This is for people you don't know sometimes. These are for people that you just hear about. These are the people that are just annoying you or get in your heart. Maybe it is people in your family that they are trapped in their foolish decisions and their sinful behavior. Because what we see is that Jesus tells the story of the father who in this story is God looking at us representative in the son and he was filled with compassion. And then it says this, it says he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Okay, so now I, I just want to pause, leave the verse up there, please. And I want you to understand there and then a little bit about the way that this is going to be. Because what the father did in that culture is very difficult for us to appreciate because we don't live in an honor culture, okay? But in an honor culture, okay, and especially the way we've gone with America, like um, we, honor cultures want to keep the body sacred for only those most precious relationships, okay? So the idea is, I shouldn't share my most precious parts physically, sexually, unless you are a long-time committed person. And biblically speaking, that is found in marriage. And that's where it's like, I now let you have all the private aspects of my body because we have a forever bond that God has sealed in a covenant ceremony. So this is in their culture, okay? Deep in the culture is honor. And the way that the man would have been dressed, he would have had his robe on, like that's part of the outfit they wore. And he would have had a prayer shawl on as well. And if it was cold or not, he would have had another outside tunic. And if you've been a Bible reader, you've heard different stories where Jesus says, you know, you know, turn the other cheek. And if he wants your, you know, your robe, give him your tunic. And if he asks you, you know, so there's this outfit that the, the father would have been wearing. What isn't in the scripture, but is in the story and certainly in the listeners to the story that Jesus is telling this to is an image of the way the dads dressed back then. So you got to imagine it's this heavy robe that goes top to bottom and it's all the way down. And then there's underneath that, the, the, a tunic that covered up your prayer shawl. And then underneath that were your outer garments, but they didn't have the way that we have undergarments now. And like the way they're made and fabricated to have like one leg in one leg in. That's not what they had back then. They didn't wear underwear. Okay, so what was underneath this man would have just been his body as God made him. And he has this big outfit. And when the Bible says that he ran to his son, everyone listening to this story would have understood the point right away. And this is why. Because this man would have had to grab the bottom. Ladies, you'd appreciate this more so because you know what it's like to sometimes have to like pull up your dress so you can go up steps and not get caught by it. This man had to grab it pull it up and if you want to run your knees can't catch the robe the stress like the dress you can't catch it it's got to be above you got to get it up above your knees so you can run so now if the image is really before us what we know is this that this man embarrassed himself with his display of love and compassion he brought out all aspects of his vulnerability he literally is running towards his son with his manhood being able to be visibly seen in the story. Now, the reason that was so striking to that audience 
is because they would have understood. You're saying God loves me so much he would put himself into that type of public shame and embarrassment to love me? And all this is, if you like good writing and good stories, is called foreshadowing. Because the Son of God will be beaten and whipped and made naked in front of everyone and shamed so he could forgive and cover all the sins of the world. So when Jesus is telling the prodigal son story, most of us hear the prodigal son and, and we think, uh, you know, like it's some faraway son that needs to come back or prodigal, you know. But what we don't really look in is not just the prodigal son. We don't look at the prodigal father. And today that's who I want you to look at differently. I want you to learn about the prodigal father who willingly will embarrass himself with his display of love for you. He will run to you. All you have to do is turn your heart towards him and acknowledge your mistake. And instantly, God covers the distance between you and him. Notice that he didn't stand back on the porch just kind of like sipping his lemonade or iced tea, letting the chair rock while the son has to walk that miserable mile all the way to the doorsteps. How embarrassing every step might have felt. But that's not our God, our city. Our God as soon as he saw him, stood up, stared only long enough to realize it was his boy and then put himself into an embarrassment to go get him. And I don't know who you are and I don't know what you're going through and I don't know what you've done, but if anyone has ever told you that the God of the Bible sees you any other way, they did not tell you the story that Jesus tells us. Jesus tells us who his father really is and what his father really is like. He's the prodigal father who chases down prodigal sons and prodigal daughters. And it doesn't stop with him running. He gets to him. He wraps his arms around him and he kisses him. And then he says that the son said to his father, you can imagine, right? What's the son been rehearsing? His speech. Don't you think he was a little uncomfortable with this display? Have you ever been so embarrassed of your actions that you don't even want someone to be nice to you? Have you ever been so embarrassed of your life that you just get out of people's lives because you don't want them to even look at your life the way it currently is and you just push everyone out and away? And it's not because you hate them. It's because you feel like you hate you. That's what the son is now probably experiencing. And he's watching his dad and probably knows his brothers down there can see the whole thing. I'm sure the servants could watch. And he's just thinking, dad, that, no, 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 don't do this. Like, let me, let me hate myself. Let me beg. Let me, let me earn back. I'm guilty. I'm embarrassment. I'm shame filled. Don't love me like this. Father. I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to even be called your boy. Don't call me son. But the father interrupted his son's speech and had heard enough of it and said, quick, bring the best robe. The best robe. Everybody knows where it is. It's in that one closet inside my room. Go get it. Instantly, the servants responding, running to get the robe. Can't believe we're getting the robe out. Not only that, he says, put it on him in front of everybody. And then he says, hey, go into my bedroom, into my closet, and go get out my chest, open it up, and inside that is a box. And that's where my special ring is. Go get that too and bring it out and put it on him and get sandals for his feet. Look how beat up his feet are put sandals on his feet. I've been hanging up that robe. I've been waiting for him. I've had that ring set aside for a good reason. I've been waiting for this day. I've been waiting for you to turn your heart back to me. And then he says, bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let's have a feast and let's celebrate. I'm sure there was one, you know, kind of on point, like one of the workers, you know, sir, are you sure? You know, we got a lot of other cows that ain't the fatted ones. You know, we don't have to 
I mean, there's tons of them we could feed this many people. We don't Listen to me, our city. The God that we serve and the God we believe in and the God that Jesus told us about that father, he celebrates the people that are like you and are like me when we return to him. When you turn your heart, when you turn your mind and you decide it doesn't matter if it's one moment, one prayer. It doesn't matter if it's one day. It doesn't matter what it is. Any time you make the decision, the conscious choice to say, God, I need you and I am a mess and I'm in a mess and I'm, I've sinned against you, and I've made mistakes, and I've messed my life up, God instantly turns and runs to get you. And he says things like this, for this son of mine was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, now he is found. And they began to celebrate. Our God celebrates us, and he loves us whenever we turn our hearts. So today, how do you do this? My question to you would be, do you need to turn your heart back to God? Do you need to say to God, I've sinned against you. I've, I've sinned against my family. I've sinned against myself. I have, I have chosen selfish paths that have hurt me and hurt those that I love. And I need to turn my heart to you, God. Maybe you're here today and you feel that your mistakes have put you in a pig pen so far away from God that there is no way he could ever love you. I want you to know today that Jesus looks at you with an everlasting love and that he willingly embarrassed himself and physically was tormented, violently killed, publicly in a shameful way in that culture, all because he wanted to cover your shame, your embarrassment, your mistakes, your wrongs, your guilt. He doesn't want you to have any condemnation. He wants you to feel a different word. It's called conviction. Conviction's an old word. We don't use it in our culture so much anymore. People don't hold convictions like they used to. Convictions used to be a set of things that you felt a conviction about, that you held to and did and wouldn't do certain things and wouldn't be certain things and wouldn't treat people in certain ways because you had conviction. It's this internal decision to do right when wrong is asking and pulling you and even you kind of want to do it, but you don't. When God wants you to feel convicted, he wants you to feel convicted to change who you're serving from you to serving yourself to serving him and saying, God, I've been serving me. I believe in you, but I've been serving me. And I want you to learn what a life will be like when you actually begin to serve God and you begin to make choices that you could wake up the next day and be proud of, that you could get supernatural wisdom to make decisions and to do things that you'll go, why did I even know to do that? How did that bless my life? That bless my family? That bless my business? My relationships are healthier? And I don't even know how I knew to do it. You won't know how to do it. He will supernaturally give you wisdom. He will give you peace peace of mind, peace of spirit, peace of heart. Some of you will get to sleep. You haven't slept very well, have you? He says, I want to forgive you. I want to remove the stain. I want to remove the pain. I want to remove all that guilt so you could sleep at night. Because you don't have to carry that. You don't have to carry all of your mistakes. I'll carry it for you. And he today brought you to our city church. You are watching online right now. Somebody sent this to you. Because God is standing on the porch looking at the horizon and he sees you and he wants to run to you and throw a celebration that you've chosen to turn your heart to him. And so I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now with every head up and every eye opened. Maybe you've been in church before, usually when it comes time to have a prayer moment like this, a lot of the pastors will ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes so no one's looking around. And at our city church, uh, we don't do it that way. Um, I just think if you can get in easy, you can get out easy. And I just think that if, if you are really, I don't, want, I'm not, I don't want to manipulate you. I'm not trying to smooth you into something. You need to make this determination that you really do want the things God has for you. You've got all you had. And now you're like, God, what do you got for me? And so if that's you today, I want to give you a chance to just 
agree with me in a simple prayer. I'm not going to call you out. You don't have to come up here, nothing like that. But I do want you to have the moment to be able to turn your heart to God. And so if you want me to include you in this prayer and you say, you know what, Pastor Chris, I need to turn my life over to Jesus. I need to begin not just to believe in him or think good of him, but I want to start to follow him and serve his ways and not my own. And if that's you and that's what you feel God is leading you to do today, would you put your hand up in the air so we could pray together today? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. I'm going to invite you now to go ahead as a team, as a church, as a community, to bow our heads and, and, and to have a moment where you can talk to God. And I'll, I'm going to lead this prayer. So the way this will work is I'll just say something and you just repeat it out loud to God. And that way you don't have to kind of worry about how to say it. You just can really focus on the meaning of it in your own heart. So if you're all right with that, I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you're a part of our city church, I'd, I'd like you to say this out loud so it's not awkward for those that are praying it for the first time and um, making this determination in their heart. Would you say this? Say, Father, I come to you today and I thank you for Jesus. I believe that he loves me and that you sent him for me. My life has become a mess with me in charge. I believe you want to clean it up. Thank you for loving me before I'm clean, right in the middle of my mess. I confess to you that I'm a sinner and I have said things and I've done things that are wrong and against what you know and have taught that are better for me. I wanna choose your ways today. Would you forgive me of my sins? I accept your grace right now, Jesus. Cover all the things I've done wrong with your love. Fill me with your Holy Spirit to convict me and to show me how to live for you and how to begin to serve you with my life. Surround me with some real Christians who will love me, walk with me, and live in community so we can impact this world for your name's sake. I give you my life for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church, let's celebrate those that have made this decision. What a wonderful day. Wow. Hey, I am, uh, I am so happy for those of you that made that decision. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Very important to hear what I'm about to say. I believe in God. I believe he's real. I believe in Satan. I believe he's real. I believe he hates you. I believe he hates God. I believe he wants to attack every good thing God tries to do in your life. I also believe he's a dog without teeth, a loud bark with no bite. So long as you walk with God. And so what I want to invite you to consider is to get yourself a Bible. And if you don't have one outside at a blue wall that says next steps, we will get you a Bible. And I want to invite you to read the book of Luke all the way through. And after that, to read the book of Acts. And then I wanna invite you to go back and read Matthew, Mark, and John. Might be hard to remember, but if you ever wanna know that again, go on Instagram, hit us up, say, he said to read something, what'd he say? And our people will DM you back, okay? But listen to me, I want you to surround yourself with the Bible. I want you to get God's word. It is a living, spiritual, powerful document. It is not just words on a page. It's supernatural and very powerful and it will build you up and make you strong. So I wanna encourage you to do that, make a point to do that this week, first thing. Second thing, um, I want to encourage you to bring someone to the series that we're starting and to make church a commitment for your life. And we tell people this, don't decide on Sundays if you're going to church. 
Don't decide every Sunday. Decide once. Make the decision one time. I'm going to church if I'm in town. I'm going to church if I'm not sick. Uh, we're going to church. I'm going to make church a part of what I do for my mental health, my emotional health, and certainly for your spiritual health. And I want to invite you to um, bring your family or your friends next week um, as we begin this series. It's going to be called Define the Relationship. We're going to be talking about your relationship with God, but also helping you how to define healthy boundaries in the relationships that you have on earth. And it's going to be a powerful series. We want you to hear what the Bible has to teach you about that. And the last thing is, I want to ask you to sign up to be water baptized. That's what the Bible teaches us is the very next step for you to do. If you want to know how do I grow in God, your next step would be this, sign up to get water baptized. And, um, and that's where we baptize out in water outside. We come gather around as a big community. It's a great chance to bring your family and your friends and to go public with your faith to follow Jesus. And if you've not been water baptized, we want to invite you to sign up to do just that, okay? Um, that concludes our part of the service for now. We're going to go back outside and be crazy and loud and festive and fun. And someone's going to win a couple different things. Thank you all for who are here today. Love all of you. Let's go change the world together. Enjoy the rest of our day. I'll see you outside to see who wins. Bye. Thanks for joining us. If you would like to help us impact more people around the world, we would love your support. You can give through the app or online at OurCity.Church. And be sure to select the Our City Online tab, which helps us know you're listening. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can subscribe, share it with your friends, click the share button, or take a screenshot and share it on your social media and tag us at OurCity.Church. Thanks again for listening. God bless.